Now that you have participated in the auction experiments in the lab, I'm going to introduce auctions and why you know we're so interested in auctions. Uh, we also will demonstrate the role of theory in data analysis, and you should watch this segment before you do the um, homework assignment for this week. So auctions goes back into ancient times. It's a mechanism, an exchange mechanism, to bargaining for selling a fixed supply of a commodity for which there is no well-established ongoing market. So, for instance, uh, if you want to buy a house, most likely you have to go through a seal bid auction. The same applies to art, uh, flowers, oil lease. Uh, in the wave of privatization and deregulation, lots of governments use auctions to auction off airwaves. So, for instance, the FCC spectrum auction is a, um, a high stake example of this. Uh, the allocation of common resources is often done through auctions. For e-commerce, for instance, uh, when you search on Google, you're often shown some of the sponsored ads. And so these, are, these slots are auctioned off through AdWords auctions. And this, is, this counts for more than 90% of Google's revenue. So it is an important institution in our current economic environment. So there are many different forms of auctions. The most common form are what's called the English auction. So this is the ascending bid auction that you see in a lot of movies. It's open outcry ascending bid. The Dutch auction is um, descending bid. Uh, what you just participated in Mob Lab is called the first price seal bid auction. And you also participated in the second price seal bid auction, which is sometimes called the Vickery auction in honor of the economist William Vickery, who formally analyzed this auction. The Google AdWords auction is called a position auction. There are many, many different kinds, and they all have very interesting properties. So let me go through the first price sue bid auction, which you have participated as a bidder. Uh, so this form of auctions is often used to reward uh, construction contracts and real estate or uh, allocate art treasures. In the mob lab environment, each bidder submits his or her bid for the object to the auctioneer. So the object is an abstract object. The auctioneer finds the highest bidder um, who wins the auction. The highest bidder gets the object being sold for a price equal to her own bids. So the winner's profit is going to be your value, your buyer value, how much is this worth to you, which we induce in the lab, minus the price you pay. And in this case, the price is your own bid. Everyone else's profit is zero. This is an example of an induced value method because every bidder is given a value for the abstract object. So you're in a group of two bidders competing for one item. This is really the simplest environment that we can come up with. The highest bidder gets the object being sold. And in the case of first price auctions, the winner's profit is going to be the winner's value for the object minus the highest bid. Everyone else's profit, in this case, the loser's profit is zero. So I'm going to go through the mathematical solution for this problem and I'm going to solve for a special case. This is officially part of game theory, um, and we use it to demonstrate how theory can help with both design and analyze experiment data. So let me first set up the problem. In a seal bid of first price auction in the private value environment, let's say we have M bidders. Each bidder has a private value we call VI, which is his or her private information. The distribution of VI is common knowledge. That means everyone knows the distribution, and everyone knows that everyone knows the distribution, and so on. And let's use BI to denote the bid for player I, and pi I to denote the profit of player I. So here's the common knowledge part. The rule of the game is common knowledge and the value distribution. So VI is drawn uniformly from the interval 0 to 100. And what we're trying to do is to solve for 
a Bayesian Ash equilibrium bidding strategy. So as a theorist, now I'm trying to figure out, to predict how bidders will bid. So let's go through the process. You must have gone through the process um, when you act as a bidder in MobLab. So how, how should you bid? You get a value, let's say uh, eight points. If your bid is higher than your value, then if you win, you will lose money because you have to pay your bid. So therefore, you should never bid above your value. We call that overbid. And how about you bid exactly equal to your value? In that case, if you win, you get zero profit. If you lose, you get zero profit. So it doesn't make a difference. So you don't want to bid at your value either. What if you bid below your value? Well, there are two scenarios. One is if your bid is not the highest bid, then your profit is zero. But if your bid is the highest bid, then your profit is going to be your value minus your bid. So there's a gap, um, and that's your profit margin. So this analysis says that you really should bid below your value. The question is, how much below? Intuitively, the less you bid, the less likely you will win the object. But if you win, you will earn more profit. So the optimal bidding strategy is essentially a trade-off between the probability of winning and the profit margin. So let's see how we resolve that. So I'm going to look at the simplest case with two bidders. When there are only two bidders, you're characterized by the strategy type two tuple, which we call BV, your bid and your value. Suppose the other bidder's value is x, and we don't know what x is, but we know that the other bidder is also rational, so the other bidder will bid somewhere between her value, you know, lower than her value. So, um, so let's say her bid is alpha x, and alpha is a number between 0 and 1. Then what's your expected profit? We use e pi for expected profit. So your expected profit is the probability that your bid is higher. In this case, you win the auction, so your profit is going to be V minus B, your value minus your bid, plus the other scenario, which is your, pro your, your bid is lower. In that case, your profit is zero. So it's P probability that your bid is lower times zero. So that term just drops out. We know that the values are drawn from a uniform distribution between zero and 100. So the probability that the other bidder's value is lower than b over alpha is going to be b over alpha divided by 100. So your expected profit is just going to be 100th of b over alpha times your profit margin, which is v minus b. But 1 over 100 as well as the parameter alpha, are just constants. And we know that in an optimization problem, we can just take them out. It doesn't affect the optimum. So we assume that you're risk neutral. If you're risk neutral, you should just choose your bid to maximize your profit, your expected profit. So you're maximizing b times v minus b, uh, your bid times your value minus your bid. And that's a quadratic function which gives you bv minus b squared. We know if you've learned optimization, we know that we can figure out uh, the optimal solution by taking the first order condition. So we'll take the first order, we'll differentiate the objective function bv minus b squared with respect to b. And the first order condition is v minus 2b, we set it equal to zero. So the idea is here's a quadratic function and you achieve the maximum profit when you, uh, you are at the top of the hill. And so that gives you the optimal bid, which is b equals v over 2, which means that if you're risk neutral and there are only two bidders in the auction, you should bid half of your value. So you can figure out the optimal solution by either using calculus or you can also use what you learned in algebra two, which is completing the square. So that will give you the optimal solution as well. So we just derived that when there are two bidders, the optimal bid for a risk neutral bidder is to bid half of our value. What if there are more than two bidders? 
it turns out that you can set up the problem in exactly the same way and you will get an optimal bid, an equilibrium bid, as n minus 1 over n times your value. In other words, if n equals 2, you'll bid half of your value. If n equals 3, if there are 3 bidders, you should bid 2 thirds of your value. If n equals 8, you should bid 7 eighths of your value, and so on. So as there are more bidders, people will shade less. So the bids will be closer and closer to the value. And the next question is, what if I am not maximizing my expected payoff? What if I'm risk averse? There are different ways of modeling risk aversion. But the generic answer is, you know, with two bidders, the optimal bid should somewhere in between your risk neutral bid, which is V over 2 and V, depending on the extent of your risk aversion. Now we're going to switch gears to field experiments, and we're going to go through a paper by Harrison and List. So this paper essentially classifies the different kinds of experiments social scientists conduct, and now we should add computer and information scientists as well. So they put the different types of experiments on one spectrum. And we'll start with conventional lab experiments. So these are experiments very much like the one that you participated, the auction experiment that you participated in Mob Lab. A lab experiment employs a standard subject pool, usually they're students. Um, there is abstract framing and an imposed set of rules. So these rules are what the experimenter carefully designed and imposed on the subjects. At the next level, what Harrison and Liz called artifactual field experiments are the same as conventional lab experiments, but with a non-standard subject pool. Now people don't use this term. They call it lab in the field. So you might be going to uh, villages and use auctions to look at how well they can bid or how much they contribute to public goods. You can measure their risk attitude. We will go through an example of lab in the field. So it gets closer to reality because now the decision makers are your real decision makers. The next level um, is called framed field experiments, so which is the same as lab in the field, but the field with the field context in the commodity, the task, the information, and the stake, and so on. So you might be working with financial advisors. Um, these are your subjects, but you know, if you look at their decision making, let's say advice giving, the context would not be abstract. It would be in the context of you know, their profession, which is financial advising. And the last one, which is very common these days, are called natural field experiments. So these are the same as a frame field experiment, but where the environment is the one that the subject naturally undertake these tasks, such that the subjects don't even know that they're in an experiment. For instance, you might want to study uh, the effect of reputation on selling price on eBay. And you could set up shops as an experimenter. You can accumulate reputation and uh, set up a seller with high reputation, and you can set up sellers with low reputation or almost no reputation. You sell identical items and figure out that will enable you to figure out, you know, how much is the return, economic return to reputation. In that case, the bidders are eBay bidders, and they would not know that they're actually in an experiment. They thought they are bidding naturally on eBay. So that's a natural field experiment. Most of the field experiment that we'll talk about in this course are natural field experiments. Natural field experiments are different from natural experiments. A natural experiment is when there are exogenous variations, but the variation might not be that exogenous. So for instance, in the 1960s and 70s, most of the musicians in major orchestras in the United States are male. And then some orchestras started to use blind auditions. In a blind audition, 
the committee cannot see the gender of the musician,、uh, so they're called by numbers, and they can only hear what the musician produces. So then, using these natural variation, which is different orchestras introduce blind auditions at different times, the economists were able to figure out that the use of a screen increases women being recruited in major orchestras. However, there could be confounds. For instance, maybe orchestras who are more aware of gender bias are more likely to introduce blind auditions. So there are lots of unobservable factors which might have confounded the outcome. In a similar context, the experimenter can control. The variation. So, for instance, if you want to study what, whether employers discriminate against job applicants with African American names, you could send out identical resumes with either white sounding or African American sounding names. So, this gives the experimenter better control over the resume quality and other characteristics. So, this is actually an example from Bertrand and Mullenathan in a very well-known field experiment. Where they uncover labor market discrimination against African Americans. You might wonder, you know, how do field experiments compare to lab experiments? What are the pros and cons? So the benefits of field experiment include, you know, you use real goods instead of induced values, and people make decisions very similar to those that they would normally make. So it's a familiar scenario. The decisions are more representative of their, you know, normal daily decisions. The cost of field experiments is that you can't control as much. You cannot control the demand and supply curves. You can't even observe as much. So, in a lab au auction, we can calculate the efficiency,、uh, whereas in the field experiment, it's actually difficult to calculate the efficiency because you don't know people's maximum willingness to pay for an object. The last topic is online field experiments, and this is something that you will probably use a lot if you、uh, end up working or you are currently working for an IT company. In the IT sector, it's often called A/B testing.、Um, so these are essentially field experiments implemented online, and the the intervention is usually delivered through different modes. For instance, it could be email messages. You control for the content of the email message by varying the variable of interest in your email.、Uh, it could be text messages. The intervention could also be delivered by modified web interface. So when people land on your website, they're randomized into one interface versus another interface, and then you can look at their behavior on your website. It could also be implemented dynamically through a browser extension, or by bots. So we will go through some of these examples as we continue this class. And if you're interested in these various techniques, you can、uh, read a short paper by Chen and Constant. So this concludes our first week's lecture, where we introduced the basic concepts and experiments, both lab and field experiments.、Um, And you will get to work on a homework problem set where that goes through some of these concepts, and you'll get to play with、uh, an auction data set.、Um, in subsequent lectures, we'll go through some of these topics in much more depth.、Uh, I hope you have fun.